Uh, welcome to the second President's Speaker Series event of the school year. Uh, I am University Provost Lon Moeller. Our focus this year has been on highlighting aviation and aerospace industry leaders and prominent alumni and important trailblazers in these and related fields for the benefit of our faculty, students, staff, and the greater community. This time, though, I'd like to recognize our host for tonight's event, Embry-Riddle President Dr. Pete Berry Butler and Dr. Audrey Butler. Our presidential speaker tonight is Dr. Maro Atala, Senior Vice President of Engineering and Technology for Collins Aerospace. Dr. Atala will provide an overview of Collins Aerospace and discuss how the company is redefining the industry. Following Dr. Atala's presentation, Oko Nelson will moderate a discussion with Dr. Atala. This year, as part of the uh, Presidential Speakers Series, we have asked some of our outstanding students to lead our discussions and to interview our invited guests for this presentation. Our moderator tonight is Oko Nelson, a junior from Houston, Texas, who is pursuing a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration with a concentration in accounting and finance at the David B. O'Malley College of Business, where he is also a recipient of the Certified Managerial Accounting Scholarship by the Institute of Management Accountants. Oko is a Dean's List student, the committee chair of the Student Advisory Board, and an associate at the Embry-Riddle Center for Entrepreneurship. Oko interned at the Boeing Company in Oklahoma City this past summer, and Oko, it looks like you'll be joining Boeing upon graduation as well. At this point, I'd like to turn the program over to Oko Nelson. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to say a big thank you to our university leadership for giving this opportunity to moderate tonight's speaker series. Today, our presidential speaker series guest tonight is Dr. Moreau Atala. Dr. Atala is a senior vice president of engineering and technologies for Collins Aerospace, a division of United Technologies Corporation. Dr. Atala earned his bachelor's and master's degree from the State University Campinas, which is in Brazil. Also, Dr. Tella has a doctor's degree in engineering mechanics from Virginia, Virginia Tech. He began his career in 1996 as a professor in Brazil. Then he moved to MIT, where he, did re, he, was, where he was a research scientist in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics. In 2000, Dr. Tella joined United Technologies Corporation as a research engineer. There he served in a number of different positions increasing in UTC's, UTC's commercial and aerospace businesses. During this time, he received an MBA from Duke University. In 2018, UTC was acquired, acquired Rockwell Collins, which is now Collins Aerospace. And there, Dr. Atella was named Senior Vice President of Engineering and Technology. In that position, he oversees a network of 16,000 engineers at more than 180 sites in more than 24 different countries. They design, build, integrate, and support more than 125 different products with, op with, 15, with 1,500 opera operators and 70,000 aircraft. Um, by the way, he speaks five different languages. Please welcome Dr. Moro Atella. Yes, so, uh, first of all, uh, this is my first time here on campus, and uh, I spent the whole day very busy visiting a bunch of different departments and different buildings, and I was very impressed to get to know the students and the facilities. Uh, so it was a great day. Thank you, President Butler. Uh, very well planned. Has been a great day. What I thought I would do is. Uh, Collins Aerospace is a new company, and I thought before uh, we have questions and answers and we talk about you know, questions you have, I would spend a few minutes just giving an overview of what Collins Aerospace is, and, and so you understand a little bit what we do. The video shows a lot of the products and the platforms that, uh, where our products fly, 
but it doesn't really do a great job in showing what is inside, what is it that we do. So I want to spend just a few minutes talking about uh, who, you know, what Collins Aerospace is, talk a little bit about the culture, some of the things we're focusing on, and, and just spending a few charts just speaking to some very high level technology strategies that we have that, that span the entire company, okay? And hopefully you understand the company a little bit better at the end. So this is an overview of Collins Aerospace. Uh, so Collins Aerospace, one way to think about it is what United Technologies used to have a division called UTC Aerospace Systems. So it's the combination of that Aerospace Systems division with Rocco Collins. And, and that was put in place November 28th last year. So we're just about to celebrate our one year anniversary of coming together as Collins Aerospace. So if you look at that, we have about 70,000 employees of those, about 17,000 are engineers, okay? We spend just north of two and a half billion dollars a year in engineering. And that includes everything from new concept development, new technology development, to product development, to support of the products in the field. It also includes uh, our own company funded as well as government funded and customer funding. Uh, and it gives you, you know, some metrics around the business for those of you that are on the business side. So it's about $23 billion in revenue. This was, you know, uh, last year. Uh, the split you see very heavy on the commercial side, 75%, 25% uh, military, and then 60-40 between selling equipment and product to the OEMs and the balance to the aftermarket, either to distributors or to the airlines. So that was a company. So this is engineering. And just some numbers on engineering. So like I said, about 17,000 engineers in the company. Um, of those we have, or we're going to have next week, 147 fellows. So one of the things we believe in is that engineers should have an option between following a management career or also staying in a technical career path. So fellows, senior fellows are the highest you can go on a technical career path. So these are the people that, you know, folks like me, when there is a challenge in an area that we don't quite understand, these are the people we go to and we rely on them tremendously uh, to make, you know, our business successful. We have engineering across 23 countries. Um, from a patent perspective, it's over 2,000 a year that we file. Um, and then inside the, the company, we create a university that, uh, where our fellows, our technical experts, they develop training material that gets delivered in a classroom, that gets videotaped, that gets delivered remotely. And we have over a thousand different courses that our engineers can take. And that's one way we find to manage knowledge, transfer knowledge, things you may not learn in school more about the product and design, that's one way we have to deliver this to, to that broad population. Um, so at, at a very high level today, United Technologies uh, is, is a corporation. It has four major business. One of them is Collins Aerospace. Another you may recognize is Pratt Whitney. Uh, a third is Otis Elevators. A fourth is Carrier right, air conditioning, fire and security. But inside Collins Aerospace, we are organized within six different businesses, right, just to make the business manageable, that $23 billion business. So the next two charts give you an overview of what are these six businesses and some of the products that we develop. So on the left are structures. Um, they're based in Chula Vista. They make the nacelles for a number of aircraft. Um, so it's a primary in the sales business. They also make some flight actuation surfaces. Um, the other one is avionics. Uh, avionics is based in Cedar Rapids. Uh, for those of you that know Rock or Collins, you probably have interacted a lot of them. Uh, and they have a lot of, uh, honestly, new disciplines and competency and products that we didn't have in UTC before. So if you look at this list, a lot of things that you find inside the cockpit, the displays, flight management computers, flight planning, uh, 
They also incorporated some businesses that UTC had, so the air data systems, uh, fire protection, both detection and extinguishing. So essentially sensors that feed the avionics systems. They're part of that, that business. Another one is interiors. So this used to be, or it is a combination of what used to be be aerospace, what used to be Goodrich interiors. Um, and it's seating for you know, commercial aircraft, it's seating for business jets, um, it is evacuation seating, I'm sorry, not evacuation seating, that's a different business, but it's life rafts, uh, it's evacuation slides, it's oxygen systems, it's lighting inside the cabin, it's lighting outside the aircraft, uh, it's de-icing uh, for aircraft, galleys, right, that's all um, in interiors. They're based in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. The other one's mechanical systems. Um, so think of this as, so you have uh, helicopter hoists, you have cargo management, you have the landing gear, you have wheels, braking systems, propellers, um, what else am I missing? Pilot controls, uh, actuators, primary, secondary uh, lift actuators on aircraft. Uh, very diverse business, uh, very heavy presence in Europe. Mission systems also based in the rapids. That's where, while all these businesses uh, have products that are sold in military platforms, the mission systems business is the one that's primarily around uh, government customers. Uh, so that's where you see communication, navigation guidance. Uh, you see uh, missile actuation. You have uh, inertia motion units for guidance. Uh, you have ejection seats. Uh, like I said before, it's here. That's where you have the spacesuit. That's where you have uh, components that go into rockets. Um, that's where you do unmanned systems from a navigation perspective, too. So it's a very interesting business from a technology perspective. And then finally, we have a business called Power Controls that has all the you know, uh, power conversion, distribution, utilization in the aircraft, all the, uh, we call air cycle management, but all the environmental controls inside an aircraft that uses a lot of energy, and also all the engine controls, all the fade acts uh, that develop in that business. So these are the six business of Collins Aerospace today. And this is like, when we talked about 125 plus product families, that's what we're talking about. And under those, there are like tens, hundreds of different products under each of them. So one way to think about it, if you think about Collins Aerospace, right? Uh, the products we develop and make, they power the aircraft, they're used to start the aircraft, they provide all the ventilation and environmental controls, control, they monitor the aircraft, it, we protect, it lands, and we stop it with a braking system. So if you look at an aircraft and you kind of combine prep weakening with it, essentially other than the fuselage and the wings, uh, a lot of that is part of UTC today, okay? So this is just an overview of the company. So, you know, so when we come to campus and we recruit, uh, and we're, when you're thinking about where you want to go work, uh, if you think of Collins, it's all of this, right? In all the different countries where we operate. One of the coolest parts of my job is that if you think about all these different products and all the technologies that are involved, uh, we spend probably every discipline of an engineer. Right? And, and I joke with people, it, it's impossible to be bored right, in engineering at Collins. There's always something new to do. Uh, so moving on to talk a little bit about the culture that we're creating in this new company that came together in this past year. So we just launched this you know, last month. Um, so it talks a little bit about the values that we only encourage the company. Uh, and I'll come back to this at the end, but it talks about why we believe we exist and what we should focus on, right? We're gonna have a world that's smarter, safer, more connected. Uh, we wanna redefine our space, and that's largely based on the creativity of everybody we have in the company, but it doesn't happen if our customers don't trust us. So we need to understand what they need. We need to follow through with our commitments. They depend on us, right, to keep everything flying safely. So that's really important. In terms of values that um, 
we want everyone to exhibit. We want people to collaborate. That's absolutely critical. We have, in, in total, probably over 200 different sites. If everyone only thinks about their own site, we will just be a collection of different companies. Uh, it's really, really important that we collaborate across you know, organizational and geographical boundaries. We want to look at hard problems, whether it's internally or externally. Uh, and like I said, if we make a commitment, we're going to do everything we can to follow through, something that's really important. And so these are some of the values we have in UTC that, that we continue to reinforce in the company. And like I was you know, going through the flight line today in the operations center, and people were talking about safety and the culture of safety there, uh, it's really, really important in this industry, right? And, and for you to reach that level of that type of culture and safety, you also need some of these components to be there. One of the things that I picked to talk about is, is this rotational program that I believe is valuable for a lot of the students uh, you know, as they graduate and they join a company. One of, the th one of the programs we started a few years ago is a rotational program where we select from the applicants uh, those that want to be in this cohort. And what that program is, it's a series of rotations four or six, depending on what the employee wants, over a two-year period, largely anywhere around the globe, certainly anywhere within the US, where the employee kind of gets to design what the rotation is gonna look like. So, and this targets employees that have been in the company two, three years, right? So these are for people that have joined the company, they kind of begun to understand the company, they kind of begun to understand the products they're working on, but then they decide that they want to learn more about the bigger company. And that's an opportunity for them to do that and rotate across the company. And it may be an engineer that decides that for their career development, they want to spend some time in program management in a different site. They may decide to spend some time in operations in the factory, manufacturing engineering. They may want to go to quality, they may want to go to design, testing, or they may want to go to the uh, to uh, flight testing, whether it's in a Bonn or Bombardier or a Barrera, right? So it allows a, a, an engineer to transition from being someone that came into a site to be really an engineer for Collins Aerospace and develops the beginning of that very good systems engineering capability and expertise, understanding how all these things come together on an aircraft. So this is something very important. I think it's something you guys should keep in mind. Uh, not very many companies do this. We're in the process of trying to expand this to a bigger part of the population so we can have more people rotating across the company, getting to understand the entire company. And because we're so large, and my comment about collaboration, they also develop a network of people they know who to call, right? And as they progress in the company, that network is going to progress, and that's extremely valuable in somebody's career. So moving on to technology. Um, we have all these different product families. Uh, we develop a number of different technologies in, in many of our sites. But there are six technologies that we tend to talk about because they touch multiple businesses and because to do those right, you need multiple businesses to be collaborating, right? So one of them is this tendency towards more electric aircraft. I mean, on the extreme, you can think about an all-electric aircraft, but even before that, uh, the H7 today is the most electric aircraft, right? Um, so that's a trend, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Autonomy is another one, and I saw a lot of activity here on autonomy. Um, so that's another area where we focus on both military and commercial. More connected, uh, a lot of connectivity within the aircraft, between the aircraft and the ground, but beyond sensor data or aircraft equipment data, there's a lot of, in terms of connectivity that touch the passenger, that touch the maintenance, that touch flat ops, right? So how do you manage all that data? How do you deliver something of greater value to the customers? Integrated systems, um, so you can have a number of different components uh, because a bunch of different companies made them before. Uh, there are opportunities now to relook at these systems from a different perspective and say, I don't need all of these components. I can achieve 
the same or better performance, the same or better reliability with a simpler system. So how do you do that? Advanced materials and manufacturing. Uh, so this is more of a capability. And then advanced methods, which is another capability. These last two kind of enable many of the other ones. So I have one chart on each of them. Um, I'm not going to read them or try not to. But uh, just to give you a flavor, right? So when you talk about more electric, it is a lot about, right, increasing power density. And it's power density not just on the motors, it's power density on the generators, it's power density of the controllers and the power electronics you have for conversion. Um, it's a lot about safety. A lot of these systems want to operate in DC. And, and when you operate in very high, very high altitudes, your air density drops, right? You don't have the same protection mechanisms you typically have here on the ground, or you have in AC systems, or you have at lower voltages. It's thinking about all those things uh, to not just drive weight down, right, and the power density up, but being able to operate safely in, in, in an architecture that we typically haven't developed over time. So there's a lot of thermal management, as you can expect, a lot of controls, a lot of material science, that, a lot of electrical engineering that goes into this. So it's a very truly multidisciplinary problem where teams in Rockford work with teams in, in, in Windsor Locks, Connecticut, uh, and that also have collaborated with some of the teams um, in, in avionics in Cedar Rapids. So it's truly a multidisciplinary topic for the company. Another one is automation. So that chart shows the evolution of the crew size over time. And so that's what you have at the top, at the bottom, uh, or throughout the chart. You see some new technologies and equipment that were in, inserted into a cockpit over time. So you're going to see that you had auto tune radio, uh, that, so that eliminated a lot of the workload that the crew had to do move to, you know, inertia navigation. Um, you start having a flight control computer, a FADAC, an engine controller, um, digital avionics. And with those developments, you start going from five to four to three crew in the cockpit. And eventually two, which is what we've had for a while now. A lot of the activity we have today it, on the commercial side is more focused on how do you reduce pilot workload. Right, especially in, in um, non-normal, abnormal situations. Um, so we have activity or research that's going on in terms of uh, pilot monitoring, biometric monitoring, making sure they're alert, uh, fully capable. Uh, there's a lot in automation, as you can imagine, controls and sensing. A lot of it is about making autopilots uh, more robust so they remain engaged for longer portions of the flight. Uh, auto land, auto takeoff, auto taxi. Uh, there are a lot of different technologies that are being developed and tested now. And we're part of a DARPA demo program where we're trying to demonstrate the capability to operate an aircraft uh, with a single pilot. Um, this is all on the commercial side. As you know, I mean, the military side, you, you can go completely unmanned today and remotely piloted, right? There is a lot of technology that's transferable. What's different is the risk profile in the missions that the military customer flies versus a commercial customer, right? And that drives risk tolerance, it drives certification requirements, drives public acceptance. So autonomy is something we invest in very heavily. We're collaborating with some of our customers to evaluate the technologies, but it's something that's going to be a while. I think it's going to be 15, 20 years before you see a jet airliner with, you know, no pilots, uh, maybe. Um, but, you know, for urban air mobility, who knows, right? I mean, again, it goes about the risk profile. The other area is, is connectivity, and, and there there's a lot of work in RF, antennas, HF, EHF, wireless inside the aircraft. Uh, we are one of the leading companies developing new solutions to allow you to use wireless inside the aircraft to transfer sensor data, not just for your in-flight entertainment system, uh, reducing some of the weight coming from wiring so you keep your uh, power uh, wiring, but you wouldn't necessarily need all the data wiring you have today. And 
It's a lot about connecting the equipment within the aircraft. It's a lot about connecting the aircraft to the ground and have greater, you know, data flow between the, the you know the aircraft and the ground. It enables autonomy. It's an enabler for that. But if you look at the bottom, there are a number of different applications that are enabled by connectivity. That not just us, a number of customers are working on those and trying to prototype those. So reliable connectivity is a very important area that drives a lot of activity in RF engineering, communications, cybersecurity, right? There are a lot of things that come together to make this possible and, and reliable to be used in the field. In terms of integrated systems, one way to look at it is how do you uh, combine a number of mechanical parts into fewer parts, right? So this is just some examples of things we do, and this is, you know, relies on, on additive manufacturing. But how do you truly design for additive manufacturing? So engineers that have been working for 10, 15 years, for the most part, if you ask them to design something using additive manufacturing, uh, they're going to design the same part. They're just going to make the, use a different process. The part itself is not going to be very different. It's not going to explore what that process allows you to do. We, there are commercial tools today, and we're developing internal tools to allow you to truly optimize not just the shape of that part, but the heat transfer, the aerodynamics, the surface properties that become very important, especially as you have flow uh, in that component, and create parts that look nothing like you had seen before. I don't have a picture there, but I mean, we have some heat exchangers that were designed to use this capability. It looks nothing like a heat exchanger anyone has seen, right? It's lighter, it's smaller, performs better, but it doesn't look like a typical heat exchanger. And you can collapse a number of these different components into something that's lighter and performs better. Um, so there is a lot of material science technology. There is a lot of mathematics on the optimization. There is a lot of all these other domains in heat transfer, fluid mechanics, stress analysis when it comes to running this uh, multidisciplinary optimization problem, uh, manufacturing. Things like calibration of these machines, right? And how do you maintain the quality system? How do you know that every machine being printed has the same properties of every other machine that has been printed before, right? We learn all of these with metals over time. This all kind of is being developed for additive manufacturing today. Um, so advanced materials and manufacturing other than additive, uh, there is a lot of work in carbon. Um, the brake system is carbon-based. Uh, if you look on YouTube, you should look for like uh, videos of a rejected takeoff test uh, to see what happens to a brake system uh, during qualification testing. It's amazing uh, the type of temperatures that that system has to survive. And we have a significant effort in, in, in product development uh, just to develop, manufacture these carbon-based systems. Thermoplastics is another very important area. I, I talked, I think it was at the, um, at the SAE competition lab. I, they were showing the car. They had some carbon uh, structural elements. So we make a lot of those also for aircraft. So these carbon tubes of metallic you know, ends that are fitted and, and, and manufactured in a way that's fully integrated into the carbon tube. Um, and all the manufacturing processes that go with it. If you, you know, the 787 cell is all for carbon composites, right? If you go to Chula Vista and you see the robot manufacturing that, that in the cell, it is incredible, right? It's manufacturing, you have all these lasers, all, you know, at the same time monitoring the quality of the process. It, it's incredible what they do. And, and the last one is, um, so model-based systems engineering. I, I personally I am a, a, a very big believer in every site I go visit, I talk about using models and physics to predict what's happening, to understand what the product's gonna do versus just building and testing. Once you have these models, the other thing you can do is put them all together and understand how these, the system interacts and understand system level effects. And we learned that during the 787 development period where, for example, we have the, the, the power conversion distribution of the 787, this massive system, very complex. 
if you look at the number of states that system can go to, uh, is such that you can't enumerate them all, you can't test them all, okay? So from a certification perspective, we had to develop methods to be able to prove that we knew what states needed to be tested and why, and once we tested them, that all the other states were safe, okay? And, and that capability continued to evolve, and this just shows how, by using models in subsequent programs in regional JATs, if you regional JATs in one and two, and you know, it was, it was meant to be an LR with a long range aircraft, um, how the development cycle becomes faster and how it goes, uh, it, it's, you have fewer problems late in development. Just using models and understanding system effects early on is really important. Now, you can't just go buy this today. There's a lot of technology development that goes into the mathematics of doing this. So instead of just using text-based requirements, how do you model your requirements mathematically? How do you test that your system is satisfying those requirements? Uh, how do you generate code? How do you certify code that's auto-generated? All those things need to be developed and tested and certified so you can use this in production. And this is a big emphasis for the company going forward. Uh, so this is my last chart. Um, and and, and it's, it's actually, I'm glad I have it because during the day this, this came up a few times in different ways. Then people ask me about what I do and, and how the company works. A, a version of this chart was shown a year ago when the company came together and was used to convey to the employees what they should expect and what is our expectation, right? And, and the reason why I have it here is because it really applies to anybody's career, I think. So you need to know who your customer is, and not necessarily just commercially. You need to know why you're doing what you're doing. Basically, that's what it is, right? And, and, and what is it that you want to accomplish, right? That's really important. You need to learn to collaborate and work together. It doesn't matter if your company has 10 people or 10,000 people, you have to be able to work as a team. It's really, really, really hard to succeed as a professional if you can't do that, right? And things will change, and we can't predict how they'll change, but they'll change. And, and some change is gonna be good, some change is gonna be initially painful, but you need to have the mindset of stepping back and trying to understand how you can you know, make that change helpful to you to either become a better professional, a better person, help the company become better, but it's a skill that we need to learn over time is how to cope with change and, and, and how to manage that, right? So I thought I'd leave with this because even as, as I was going through the day today, people were asking, in the end, it comes back to one of these three things, right? They're, they're all important uh, if, if you want to be successful in your career. Uh, and so that's it. So. All right, Dr. Attila, I see you did a tour of our university, and I like to say that we've built a lot, it's changed a lot since when it first started. Uh, for example, if we build the student center, which I like to call it the spaceship because it looks so amazing. Um, the first it question, is nice building. yes, yeah. <laughs> the first question I'd like to ask you is what, ha what are the things that's led you into your career in the aerospace industry? Um, so, growing up, I always liked you know mathematics and physics. So I I knew fairly early on that I wanted to be an engineer. Um, I, I was at the rocket lab today, and and uh, I remember my my days as you know early teenager where I used to make my own rockets at home, which was not necessarily safe. Um, but I always liked uh, engineering. I liked to make things. Um, I was always fascinated by airplanes and, and fire jets. Um, but as I went to college and, and I progressed my career, I ended up working mostly on, on non-aerospace areas. Um, and when I had the opportunity to, to uh, because a, a lot of my early career was in the Corporate Research Center of United Technologies. And there I worked with the non-aerospace portion of ETC for the most part. 
And in 2012, uh, UTC was acquiring Goodrich, was creating the, this aerospace systems division. And I had the opportunity to leave the research center and go to, to, to hardcore engineering, the business unit. And, and so it was a great opportunity to go back to aerospace and, and, and learn and all that's involved in aerospace. So I, I took that, that opportunity right away. Wow. And also, I know you hold a business degree and an engineering degree. So those things coupled together, how does that, how does, how has that helped you in your career? Um, so the technical degrees are very helpful because, so again, I learn mathematics, I like mathematics, I like physics. Um, I enjoy doing all of that. Uh, it was honestly for my personal enjoyment, it was not because I was looking for a job. I, I really like doing that. Once I joined the company, after a few years, I realized that I had a fairly narrow view of the world. Like I, I understood engineering, I understood technology, um, but I had a hard time understanding why certain decisions were being made. Um, and, and that's why I, I, it took me a couple of years to convince the company to pay for the MBA. Um, but that's why I decided I thought it was a good idea to do the MBA. And honestly, much more than the coursework, it was all the students in the classroom that I learned from. The vast majority were not engineers. And in the program there was that they forced you to work in groups. And when you have a group when someone is a colonel in the Marines, someone else does marketing for pharma, someone else is in IT, uh, someone is a CFO, uh, Germany, Taiwan, it, you learn and you have to do things as a group. It helped me get a much broader view of what, a, what solving a problem looks like. So the way it helped me was more about learning to see things from different perspectives and think more globally about a problem than just, just the technical aspect. Yeah. I remember when I did my internship at Boeing, um, I was estimating price of an intern, and part of my job was to talk to engineers. And sometimes I did have no clue what they talked about, what they said. And to me, I feel like having an engineering and business degree helps you a lot because you can relate to business people, high-level executives within the company, and also really relate to engineers and, you know, especially as a, in the engineering firm as Collins mm -hmm. Aerospace. Yeah, you learn the lingo that's helpful when you learn about you know, cash flow and profit mm -hmm. and, and, and you understand why, what drives certain decisions, and that's very, very important. Yeah. I know you did, you're a scientist and you did research at MIT and you moved from academia to the corporate world. How was that transition like? Um, it, 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 I mean, it, it was fine. I mean, it, what, so it was fine because there aren't many corporate research centers left, right? And they provide a very nice um, impedance match to people that come from academia to get into industry. So it's industry, but you're still doing research. Um, I think the, the aspect that was, uh, I guess, more interesting was that things are very dynamic, right? So a, a program or an area that may be important today, in sometime in the future, based on a bunch of different issues or situations, may be deemed to be not important anymore and the work stops, right? Uh, a company has finite resources and you need to make sure you invest in them and what's important for the company. And so you, you reassign people, you, you redo your priorities. And so I lived that through, through that a few times. And at the beginning, it's unusual. That doesn't happen in academia very often. Yeah. Uh, but once you get used to it, then that's how I began to ask all these questions. About, so, why is this happening? That's what got me to business school and, and try to understand what is it that was going on that I didn't see at the time. Okay. Um, how would you describe your leadership styles? I know you manage around 16,000 people globally. And how does your leadership style have an impact on those people you manage? Hmm. Um, so first of all, I mean, yeah, there's 16, 17,000, but there are a lot of people. I mean, I, I, there, there are, so there are seven VP of engineers in the company. Uh, they drive a tremendous amount of work. They, they truly lead these organizations. Uh, 
it's an outstanding team that is there. Um, leadership style, I don't know, it's a, hard, it's a hard question for me. It's, I try, I'll tell you this, I try to have a team that complements me. Um, that's one thing that I learn over time. I tend, so I'm very analytical, I'm very, like I'm perfectionist, uh, which is painful sometimes. Um, I'm an introvert, right? So I try to have a team that balances that a little bit. Um, so I, I, it's good to have discussion, it's good to have debate, it's good to push back. Uh, at some point we need to agree and move on and get things done. Uh, I, I do have to trust the team, right? In any organization of any size, you have to trust the team, otherwise something's not there. Yeah. Um, but I would say, I, I guess, the most important decision I guess any leader makes or they need to focus on over a period of time is making sure they have the right team for what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah. And, and if they don't, you know, it doesn't mean the person is not a good, outstanding employee. It just may be in a different role, yeah. right? And part of your job is figuring out how can that person be the most productive they can be in the company, which may be a different role and help that person find that role. But, but your job is to make sure you have the right team for what you're trying to accomplish. And, and because it's hard enough, even if the right team, so you need to have the right team, otherwise it's too hard. So you, when you look for employees, you look for employees that can add value to the company and the team that they are working with, right? Yes. So you have to, you, you, you have to have knowledge um, and you, you need to be able to work with a team and you need to be able to understand uh, where people are coming from so you can work with them, yeah. right? So it's not just the hard skills, but also soft skills. What are the things that has helped or aided you into you becoming, you, to you going into your current position now as an executive at Collins Aerospace? Um, we, we, so part of it is there are, we always have very hard problems. Um, and every once in a while, people think you're capable of solving them. And, um, and they go ask you, why don't you go try to see if you can help them? So I did a few of those, and I, I must have done OK. Um, but I think part of it is taking risks. Right? Every once in a while, you need to say, this is important, or this is not, and taking a risk. And, and, and because the more you rise in an organization, doesn't matter what level, you need to have an opinion. You need to. It, it, it's absolutely important to hear to others and, and listen and, 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 and be willing to change your opinion, but you need to have an opinion to start with, yeah. right? And you need to be willing to take some risks. And what advice would you give someone that wants to be a leader within a company like yourself? I don't know. I don't know if I'm a good person to give advice. <laughs> um, I, I, like I said, I mean, it's, it's important to um, be... <coughs> very good at what you're trying to do, be able to work with others, um, at the right times be willing to take risks, um, and, on, and, and, be trying, and try to collaborate with others, try to help others. I mean, in the company we give a huge amount of value to people that will spend time beyond whatever they need to do to go help somebody else, even if it is to share something that hasn't worked. Right, and how did they learn that, and what did they do to fix it? Uh, but learn and, and, and share that with others so others don't go through what they went through. That's a big deal as well. Also, what are the accomplishments that you had in your career that are the most impactful to you? Um, I don't know, I mean, I mean we, we we all develop a bunch of technologies. We're all involved in a bunch of products. It's nice to see the products we have worked on, you know, flying today, get on a plane and be able to recognize things you work on. But I, I think if I, I guess, I guess it would be, it would be non-technical things, right? Uh, when I left the research center and I came to, to what used to be UTC Aerospace Systems, I was in, in a part of the business that was being combined with another, and I had a role in bringing these two organizations together. 
And then I got promoted and I had a role in bringing this bigger organization together. Now in this past year, I have a role in trying to bring the, the ATC Aerospace Systems and the Rockwell Commons organizations together. Uh, so that's, that's very cool to do. Um, it's not technical. Uh, it, it requires this team to make it work, right? Yeah. So it's all the leadership team, it's all the engineering VPs, it's me, it's the business leaders. Uh, but being part of that, and having done this like two, three, four times now, yeah. it, it is very cool to be able to look back and see a company beginning to operate in a common way. That's very, very cool. Yeah. Very soon we'll be having our Q&A session. So if you have any questions for Dr. Attila, please come down to the mic. Remember, um, students first. Also, where do all the great ideas, great and innovative ideas within your company, where do they generate? Where do they facilitate? Where do they come from? Um, the engineers. Um, I mean, in the engineer, there are a lot of good ideas in ops and digital, you know, but there is no, there is no special group that comes up with the great ideas. Yeah. Um, sometimes certain ideas require special skills that are not necessarily available everywhere to be developed, and then you, you end up assigning groups to go work them. Um, but I, 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 my experience is when I was at the corporate research center, one of the things that I saw many times, a technology would be developed, we would demonstrate the technology, and it would never make into a product, or it would take 20 years to make into a product. And so that transition from a, a research center to an engineering organization was something that was difficult to make work well. And what I've tried to do since is to, we have a technology budget, we have people that are in a technology organization, um, but we try to scope the projects and staff the projects so that they require engineers to be part of the team. Yeah. So in the same team you have people with master's PhDs doing technology development, but you also have a bunch of engineers that are working together. So everyone has a stake in the outcome. Everyone is shaping it. Everyone feels a little bit, you know, the father or the daughter, or the mother or the baby. Yeah. Um, and I believe that helps reduce a lot of that transition risk. And also surprises late in development when someone didn't account for some condition during the technology development that becomes important with product development. So there is no special team. Uh, it's, 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 everybody has ideas and then it's a little bit about how do you put the right group of folks together to make it move forward. Yeah. And what advice would you give people in the audience that want to pursue aerospace engineering? What type of skill sets do you look for when you want to hire someone, an engineer, an aerospace engineer? Um, you, you, you need to be, you need to be good. I mean, you need to be good at engineering, right? To me, uh, I, I, I personally put a lot of value in just technical knowledge. To me, this is important. Uh, so if you're in school and studying, learn as much as you can. Uh, this is important. But beyond that, attitude matters a ton. Uh, being, being, having demonstrated the ability to be flexible. So even for international students that have moved from their country and they're here studying, demonstrates an ability to adapt to a different environment, to a different language, to a different school system, people that move around the country. I mean, there are different ways to demonstrate adaptability, but that's something that's very important to be able to demonstrate um, and, and, and be able to work with others. Um, that, that's, that's, you have to be able to do that. Good. Also, I know you're from Brazil. So how is the transition from being an international student coming all the way to America and studying um, engineering here? Um, I, I, I'm not a good example uh, <laughs> because um, in my undergrad, I, I think it was a, so in Brazil the undergrad is five years long uh, and by the end of my second year I was already doing internships in one of the labs in, in the School of Engineering. So I was always attached to research as an undergrad. Uh, I did half of my last year of college in Germany um, so 
coming to the U.S. was a lot less of a shock than going straight from Brazil to Germany yeah. uh, as an undergrad. Um, much less of a cultural shock. Um, now, I mean, it, 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 to me, it was more language than anything else. I was very lucky that I had an office mate that would spend time with me and correct my English and, and force me to speak. And, and uh, so he, he was great with me. So he's actually, uh, he used to be in Dayton, he's in Tennessee now, he's a dean of the college there now. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, he, he helped me a ton just like in communication. That, that made a big difference. But culturally, um, it was not, well, not a big issue. It wasn't. And how did you, how did you learn how to speak five different languages? It's, 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 <laughs> look, it's, it's, it's not that, it's not all that. It's, it's, so you learn to speak Portuguese and some of the Brazilians here know this. You know, you know how to speak Portuguese. So Spanish, we get exposed to Spanish a lot in Brazil. So you understand Spanish. Italian is not that different. And so because I was in Europe for a while, you get exposed, my wife's family, you know, it's, and I, actually the one that I really learned, or the two that I really learned were English and German, yeah. right? Uh, but I hadn't practiced German so long that I, I understand, but I, my accent is just not, it doesn't fly anymore. So. Well, um, do we have any questions from the audience? If you have any questions, please come to the mic. I've watched some of the TED Talks, and they have this concept of circular runway, and it sounds crazy. Uh, have you seen that, and is it a good idea, bad idea? I, I, look, I, I, I've seen it, I haven't thought a lot about it. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know. But I've seen it. Um. Next question. Well, one of the questions that I have for you is basically I saw in your presentation, you were talking about electrical planes. Um, like my personal opinion on that, I just want to know what Collins thinks is that, I mean, electrical planes would need power from somewhere and that power is normally generated from CO2 emissions and all of that, which is the main thing about electrical cars and planes mm -hmm. and everything going to electrical. Like, what is Collins' approach on that's then how how they think like how you guys think especially um, to overcome this big problem you know on well okay you guys are being ecological in maybe a local place but on another area there is people generating CO2 maybe with other types of emission or maybe nuclear power too or but how efficient would that get you know so the, I, I mean there is a very a strong trend, particularly now around you know sustainability, especially in Europe. Um, so if you talk to European airlines, European manufacturers, engine manufacturers, there's a very uh, large concern around uh, reduction of CO2. They talk about decarbonization, I believe is the term that they use. Um, and that includes a number of different things that it can include using renewable fuels uh, for the aircraft. And some airlines are already testing that today. So this is not futuristic. Uh, there is a question about how much supply do you have of biofuels uh, to, to make you know, a big impact on the industry. Um, there are, there's a whole thing about more electric. Uh, so yes, you can regen energy, you can store it. Um, but there's honestly a lot of it that is about how you go in terms of manufacturing your components. Um, so you can use aluminum, you can use metals, you can use composites. You may be able to use composites that use natural fibers. Uh, so I was visiting one of our sites uh, a few months ago and they were showing me how they were proposing to make some of the components using essentially fibers that come from trees, right? And they were trying to work on the flammability aspects of it, which can become an issue. Um, but the, the attention is there in the industry. Um, and everyone is trying to tackle the part of the problem they can. Um, as a company, what United Technology has done for the last, I mean, since I joined, at least for 20 years now, they have placed fairly uh, strict and very visible targets in terms of water use reduction, CO2 reduction, 
packaging material that we use, uh, you know, we ship things, uh, safety. So these are all things that we measure at the corporation level that we always have targets that we need to think about what we're going to do better next year uh, in how we operate the business to reduce that. So it's not just about the product and playing. I think it's a lot about how the company actually goes about you know, operating. So it's like the company being as sustainable as possible with all the processing? I mean, you can always do more, right? Mm -hmm. You can always do more. Uh, but but it, we try very hard. We try very hard. Um, the, the, there is, and, and, and you mentioned nuclear before, and, and, and I don't know why, but I was watching Netflix you know, last week. Uh, so there is like a three chapter series on Bill Gates, and yeah. I was watching that. Um, and, and the last one, he talks about nuclear, right? And how nuclear, in some ways, is better for the environment, in some ways, than everything else we use today, mm -hmm. right? You know, we need to make it safe. It's not necessarily popular right now, but. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Like, I'm really well directed, anyways. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Next question. Yeah. My question uh, is also kind of related to electricity uh, and aircraft. Uh, I'm working for Embraer right now, and one of the projects that I'm somewhat involved is the urban mobility, so okay. the EV tolls that are coming yep. up. And uh, one of the big issues that we run into right now is uh, the power generation. So the batteries are not developed enough to be able to, you know, sustain a whole aircraft flying for, I guess, the range we're looking at is about 60 miles right now, uh, and it's also limiting, uh, you know, a lot of the weight and the capabilities of these aircraft. Since you have more of a background in research and you know your company deals a lot with the batteries and everything, I'd like to know when do you see uh, you know these batteries getting developed enough so that the urban mobility, urban air mobility, can become a thing. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it, no, it, it's tough because I mean whoever solves that problem, they're they're rich. Right? <laughs> um, it's the, the the if you plot energy density on battery over time, right? It's not, it's not getting better fast enough. And there are a lot of small companies around trying, but no one has found a way uh, to figure out the chemistry. I visited a few startup companies that in, in this space, urban air mobility, where at the beginning they had this ambition that they're gonna figure out the right cell chemistry and make it work. And almost all of them eventually learned that this is not our thing. We're gonna integrate the aircraft who, wait until somebody figures out the chemistry. Um, it is a problem, right? And if you, in the urban air mobility space, if, if there is, a, if there is an, a, an application where you may be able to do all electric is urban air mobility, but you need to worry about the range. Um, but beyond the urban air mobility, you can do a lot without going on electric. I mean, in cars, I mean, they were hybrid for a long time before we started having Teslas, right? Um, you can do a lot in terms of hybrid architectures, and you can do a lot in terms of clever ways to generate the energy you need versus carrying it in a battery. It's like carrying a bucket of water with you as you need it. Um, so there may be different ways to generate that energy on demand uh, as you need it. Um, but that may not completely get rid of fossil fuel. Fossil fuel is, is, it's a very energy dense, right? It, it's hard to beat it. We used to have a vice president of, of um, a technology at Pratt Whitney, uh, Epstein, um, who used to say that, you know, I think it was, what did he say? I think he said, goose fat, essentially had, I mean, you look at that energy density in fuel, for birds, birds fly, right? So that's where they take the energy from. And you look at jet fuel, it's, the energy density is not that different. I mean, they were great. Um, so for batteries to overcome hydrocarbons, it's something different needs to be done. Uh, and and I, have, I haven't seen it yet. But you can do a lot in hybrid. It doesn't mean that you can't do anything. It's just a completely get rid of a jet engine and putting an electric engine on an A320 or a 737. That's, that's going to be a while. That's going to be a while. We're talking about 10, 20 megawatts. It's going to be a while. Thank you. Yep. Good question. All right, my question is, being uh, working both for the corporate sector and the engineering department of the company, has there ever been any battles where the corporate side is maybe in 
had too much influence over the engineering where it lost creativity or vice versa? Um, not, not that way. Um, we, we have, so there are different, if you look at how IBM does research in their research centers, if you look at how Skunk Works operates uh, or how G Research operates, there are, or Mitsubishi Electric, I mean, there are a few left. There are, there are very different ways for you to run a research organization, an engineering organization. If you look at all of these, they're all different. Um, the way we run them, and I'm not saying it's perfect by a long shot, but um, the business units, they, they, they set the priorities for about 70 or 80% of the work that happens at the research center. So the topics that get researched uh, or worked on are topics that are relevant to the business. And there's about 20, 30% where corporate gives funding to the research center for them to do things they believe were being too conservative and not paying attention, um, but that they believe is important and gives them the freedom to go try to demonstrate that to the point where we can go and say, oh, I believe it, right? So having that balance is important. Uh, so it never got to the point where it drove away creativity from, from engineering or uh, that we completely killed all, all innovation in the corporate research center. There is, there is a balance, there is tension, there is no question, there is tension in the system. But it's not necessarily bad, tension is not necessarily bad. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Tal. Uh, my question is, what are the challenges of calling service space in attending the safety demands of its clients for aircraft, aircraft certification, especially for uh, regarding aviation authorities in different countries? Um, so it hasn't been an issue, right? Um, the, the, the rules of certification are fairly clear. Um, there is always some interaction clarification and things that we need to change. But for the most part of what we do as a company, we're providing products to Embraer, Bombardier, Boeing Airbus, Mitac, Comac, right? Uh, North Air Lockheed. Um, and they're the ones that have that interaction certification authority for the most part. It, it all comes down to requirements. If the requirements are very clearly understood, there isn't much uh, interaction in the end of development. It's when you have some fuzziness, or honestly, when you're trying to bring new technology. So when we talk about model-based systems engineering and where you may not go there and code everything, uh, being able to demonstrate to the CERC authorities uh, that it is equally safe, uh, if not more, it, it, then, then we do that. Um, but for the most part, uh, it's a fairly good working relationship. Thank you. Uh, some observers um, looking at uh, the efforts in um, urban uh, air, air uh, transportation have observed that um, uh, our current ATC won't won't handle that. What is your vision to solve that and what opportunities will that present to Commons? So, um, so from a technology perspective, that problem is a, it's already being tackled a little bit because in some situations you have some of the military drones flying commercial airspace, right? So that interaction between a drone uh, flying an airspace that's controlled with traditional technology, that's beginning to happen today. I think the challenge is you don't have thousands of drones flying in interacting that same airspace, right? So being able to have position navigation timing, PNT type technology, uh, so we have ADSB today uh, for some aircraft that is the location. Uh, so knowing that's going to be very important, automation is going to be very important on how to do that. Uh, part, of the, part of the company is, is a business that's called Eric, 
Uh, so they're based in, in Maryland. It's an acquisition that happened, I want to say, five, seven years ago by Waffle Collins. And Eric has a lot of that interaction with data and air, trans and air traffic management. Um, so um, I, honestly, I, I'm trying to think about how to answer that. It, it moves slowly, right? So if, even in Europe now, they're going through an effort to uh, reduce congestion and try to improve or reduce separation between aircraft. Uh, and that takes time. It, it requires uh, an upgrade of a lot of the infrastructure in the continent to do that. Doing something like this here would require the same. There would be a lot of upgrade to the infrastructure to be able to manage things in a more automated way. I think it's likely that um, the first attempts at urban air mobility are likely, I mean, at a little bit bigger scale, are likely to happen outside uh, Europe and the US. Um, you see uh, places like uh, New Zealand, uh, Dubai, China, where uh, they're more likely, I think, to try that. And that's, and then we'll have to learn, right? A lot of this we're going to learn and observe and get better over time. But it, it will be a while before you get to that scale of aircraft flying, I think, in the same airspace. It'll be a little while. Well, thank you, Dr. Atola, for coming to Andrew Riddle and interacting with our students. It was a good time having you here in our speaker series today. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everybody, for, for having me. I will now welcome um, Provost Miller to end the series. I just uh, want to thank each and every one of you for attending tonight. Special thanks to Oko and uh, Dr. Tal. If we could give them a round of applause as well again. We look forward to seeing you at the next presidential speaker series, which will be on February 11th, uh, 2020. Thank you. Very nice.